So I'm going to go ahead and get started with taking the roll real quick. Um, so let's see, uh, Grant Amerson. Here. Thank you. Uh, Brandon Ashlock. Here. Jacob Bouton. Here. Wade Burton. Uh, Claire Casadesis. Here. Chandler Davidson. Uh, Juliana Damari. Cameron Dreher. Here. Brooke, I see you. Um, Julia Everett. Jack Foyle is here. Yep. Uh, don't Garrett Gresham. Daniel Hill. Brian Joes over there. Cade Leo. Here. Jacob Matthews. Here. Uh, Dylan Miller. Noah Perkins. Thank you. Uh, Alexander Petty. Nicole Robles. I'm here. Tristan Sharp. I'm here. Joseph Saharath. Uh, Kinsley Spatafora. Here. Sophia's here. Ray Wickland. Michael Martin. And I see Kendra right in front of me. All right, so before we jump into uh, a lecture today, I want to discuss something with you um, briefly. So there's a lab assignment on Monday. And uh, in fact, all of the subsequent mini lab assignments starting from uh, number five all the way through number eight require the use of what's called a function generator. Um, we do not currently have any of those in this room. Um, because they are still on order and have not yet been um, received. So we do have the digilant boards that we've used for several years uh, in that closet right there. So we could use the lab or we could complete the labs uh, using them. That would require at least one person per group or whatever, um, bringing a laptop to class and installing a little software package, which I can give you guys the link for. Um, and then it'll take roughly the full class time to do the lab. Uh, or to do each of these subsequent labs. So that's one option. And a secondary option is I set up a digilant board here and then we project the lab over Zoom and uh, you know in the classroom and all that kind of stuff. And I do the experiment and then you guys collect the data and we talk about it and handle the lab that way. So which one is your preference? I see one person raising their hand for option two. I, literally don't see anyone raising their hand for option one. Anybody on Zoom want to actually do the labs themselves or have me do it and you guys? I would like you to probably do it. It'll also help us if there's any technical issues to trying to download or anything. I think having you help us do it and everything will make sure that there's no technical. All right. Well, so far every single vote is for number two, several people abstaining, so the twos have it. So on, um, next Monday, I will do the lab. I might take some pictures uh, of the experimental circuit and stuff like that, but we'll, uh, I'll show you guys the results of the lab and we'll talk about the data that you're collecting and then you'll fill out the, the lab sheets yourselves. So that means that all you guys on Zoom can actually participate in the lab as it were uh, as well. So that's good too. All right, so with that out of the way, then let's jump into our problems for today, which I ran out of time to write them down, so we'll get to doing that right now. Um, so what we're talking about today is what's called the total response of RL and RC circuits. 
So in a total response problem, my pen will write oh, something red. We have sources that are left in to the circuit that contribute to its behavior at T is equal to infinity. And that's very different than what we had uh, in class on Wednesday. We saw on Wednesday, or hopefully you guys noticed, that every time that switch changed positions, it effectively removed sources from our circuit. And those sources were no longer able to contribute to the behavior of the capacitors and or inductors in our circuits. So today we're gonna to be dealing with circuits and systems where the source is left in and still able to affect the behavior of our energy storage elements. And so our first circuit is this guy right here. Let me put all my resistor values in real quick. I should have a five ohm down here. And our quantity of interest will be our capacitor voltage VC of T with this polarity. And we're only gonna be worrying about the capacitor voltage on this particular problem. And we're gonna be working the problem with a switch here on the right hand side, closing at T is equal to zero. So let's talk about what that switch is really doing. To, to see what the fundamental difference between a natural response problem, which is what we've been working, and a total response problem is. Um, so what that switch does is it doesn't take that six amp source out of the circuit and it doesn't put it into the circuit. All it's really doing is shorting out that 20 ohm resistor in the top right of the circuit. But that is enough of a change to knock this guy out of DC steady state, okay? Now, a long time after that switch has closed and that 20 ohm resistor has been shorted, we should observe that the capacitor voltage VC of T will assume a value that is non-zero. And that's the biggest fundamental difference between a total response problem and a natural response problem. In a natural response problem, we expected everything to decay to a value of zero. And in a total response problem, we're expecting things to decay to a non-zero value that's governed by the forcing function, which is just a source in the circuit. So the only change that we're gonna to have to make to our circuit analysis is literally analyzing the circuit at T is equal to infinity, and then using those results to um, slightly modify our generic expression. So as before, our first step in any problem like this is to analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero minus. So in our case, that's a DC steady state circuit. So here we have our six amp source. Resistor, 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 short. Our capacitor is gonna be an open circuit because we are at DC steady state at T is equal to zero minus. So let's see, five, five, 20, five, 10, 10. And our quantity of interest is this voltage VC at zero minus. So how would you all suggest we go about trying to solve for that voltage? Any thoughts or suggestions? Again, this is nothing more than a DC circuit. So you guys at this point should be fairly comfortable looking at these.
So um, you're saying if I knew this voltage drop, that would help me? Am I, or am I misunderstanding your statement? Okay, I, uh, I don't disagree with that statement, but I also don't fully, I, I'm, I'm unsure of how much that's going to help. And so let me explain um, what I mean here. So, uh, so there's a couple of different ways that are jumping out to me to approach this thing, okay? So the first is that we know that six amps is gonna flow into this top node. And then some of it's gonna split and flow down this way. And some of it's gonna split and flow down this way. And we can figure that out by current division. And then we could use Ohm's law to figure out the voltage drops over all of those resistors. So for instance, I could figure out what this V10 left is, what this V10 right is, and then write a simple Kirchhoff's voltage law equation around this, uh, this loop, and I could figure out what VC is. That's one way that we could approach this. Another potential way that we could approach it would be to use nodal analysis, where we call this guy, let's say VA, this guy VB, and here we'd have VC, here we'd have VD. So we're running into a little bit of issues here, but I don't think it would be insurmountable. And we could say that the capacitor voltage was um, the difference between VB and VA. Uh, alternatively, we could do mesh analysis and it, we wind up getting almost the exact same, well, we, we would get the exact same relationships if we did the, the current division method that I discussed first. Um, so my, uh, let's, let's explore the current division route. Okay. So I'm going to call this current I capital L and I'm going to call this current I capital R. So current for the left branch and a current for the right branch. And we're gonna need both of those, right? So using current division, I can say that IL is going to be six amps multiplied by what? I'm trying to find IL. So what goes in my numerator? Would it be five ohms? Uh, so it'll be 15 ohms. Uh, and it's 15 ohms because it's the total series resistance of that left branch, right? So we want our source to look like it's in parallel with uh, or, or the current that's entering the node seeing two parallel branches. So we need the total resistance of each parallel branch. So it would be five ohms plus 10 ohms, which is 15 ohms, which I think Sophia said. And in our denominator, we'll have one over five ohms plus 10 ohms plus one over 20 ohms plus 10 ohms. And this is going to give us some number. So let's take a moment to calculate what that is. I get four amps. Anybody else get, all right, getting some thumbs up. So knowing IL is four amps, what must IR be? Two, just using Kirchhoff's current law, right? We don't need to set up a whole nother current division equation. We can do simple algebra uh, and apply KCL at that node. So it will be six amps minus IL 
which is exactly two amps. So now we could say that V10 on the left hand side is IL multiplied by 10 ohms, which is going to be 40 volts. And V10R, the voltage drop over the 10 ohm resistor on the right hand side, is IR times 10 ohms, which will be 20 volts. So using this information, we can write a KCL expression, or excuse me, a KVL expression around that blue loop. So we're going to have negative V10L minus VC at zero minus plus V10R is equal to zero, which means V10R is equal to V10L plus VC or V10R minus V10, sorry, L. Dang it. Is equal to VC. I did one extra step of algebra in there because I forgot what I was doing. Um, so does everybody agree with my case KVL expression around my blue loop? Let's make sure. I got all my signs and all that kind of stuff correctly. So I started from the bottom left hand corner. You can see the negative sign of E10 and the negative sign of ET or BC positives uh, polarity terminal for V10R. Then if I move BC to the other side, it's 10R minus 10L. Yeah. So what's VC at T is equal to zero minus that? negative 20 volts. All right. Our next step would be to analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero plus. I would argue that we do not have to do this step for this particular problem. Can anybody tell me why? Exactly right. The voltage drop over our capacitor cannot change abruptly. So we know for a fact that VC at zero plus must be identical to VC at zero minus. And that's the only information that we were looking for. So we don't need to do any circuit analysis whatsoever for step two in this particular problem. If we were looking for any other quantity other than the capacitor voltage, we would need to actually do the circuit analysis. So I, I want to be very, very clear about that. Uh, for step three, we're going to analyze the circuit. Could you explain again why you don't have to do it for this particular problem? Okay. So our quantity of interest and our only quantity of interest, to be clear here, is this capacitor voltage, right? Fundamentally, we know that the capacitor voltage cannot change abruptly um, because in doing so, that would mean that an infinite transfer of energy has occurred, which relates to the laws of physics. So that means that VC at zero plus, the moment immediately after the switch closes, has to be the same as VC at zero minus the moment before the switch closes. If VC at zero minus and VC at zero plus are the same thing, and we're not looking for any other information, we've already found it. So that's why we don't have to do the circuit analysis. Gotcha, that makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, so really all you would be doing if we did the circuit analysis is putting a negative 20 volt source in there and then saying, yep, there's a negative 20 volt source. You wouldn't actually do any analysis whatsoever. All right, so now we're going to analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity. At T is equal to infinity, we are working under the assumption that all of our transient conditions have decayed. So we have another DC steady state condition. We just have a different position on the switch. So we're going to look at our original circuit. So with that switch closing at T is equal to zero, 
that means that that 20 ohm resistor is shorted out for all time greater than t is equal to zero plus, right? So we can just replace the 20 ohm resistor with a short circuit. And because we're at DC steady state, we're gonna replace our capacitor with a um, open circuit like we did in step one. So our circuit that we are going to analyze is gonna look something like this. So this short circuit that I've just drawn right there on the right hand side is representing that that resistor has been shorted out. What was this guy, 10? Okay, and there's another five ohm resistor down here. And here is our quantity of interest plus minus DC at infinity. So how are we going to determine DC at infinity? Yeah, yeah, so we can, we can absolutely approach this problem in the exact same way that we approached it in step one because the difference is very, very minimal, right? So we know that six amps is flowing in. So let's call this guy IL. Let's call this guy IR using current division. We know that IL is going to be six amps times, so in our numerator here, we're going to have one over five plus 10 divided by one over five plus 10 plus just one over 10 this time. So that's one over 15 divided by one over 15 plus one over 10. Twelve fifths, which is 2.4 amps is what I got. Did anybody else get that same number? All right, getting some thumbs up here. Um, so from that, IR is what? 3.6, just using Kirchhoff's current law at that top node. And so now let's define this guy V10L and V10R. V10L is 10 times 2.4 is 24 volts. V10R is 3.6 times 10 ohms is 36 volts. And so we should see that VC at infinity still gonna be V10R minus V10L is 12 volts. Dr. Hartman, I have a question. Uh, yes, where did the 20 ohm... Where did the 20 ohm resistor go? Yeah. All righty. So, The arrow indicates on this switch that the switch closes at T is equal to zero plus, which means this guy right here looks like a short circuit for all T greater than zero plus. So we have a short circuit in parallel with a 20 ohm resistor, which looks like a short circuit. Gotcha, gotcha. Alrighty, any other questions before we calculate our time constant or anything? Mr. Foyle, how can I help you?
Could you repeat your question, please? So at t is equal to infinity, we look at it as an open circuit because t is equal to infinity represents such a long time into the future that all of the transients have decayed so that we are again at a DC steady state condition. So, so what the general expectation here is, um, and I, I don't know exactly what the, the values are gonna be, um, but so for uh, generally speaking here, we have some value of our capacitor voltage. Uh, so this is gonna be VC as a function of time, and this is T, right? Then at some later point in time, which we'll call infinity, but really it's just a long time after the switch is closed. It's now settled to some non-zero value, but it's still constant. And then in between those two conditions is our transient. So we have steady state, transient condition, and then steady state again. So for zero minus and earlier, we have a DC steady state. And for infinity and later, we have a DC steady state and everything in between is our transient. Right, after the transient has died out at the secondary DC steady state condition. And the reason why we didn't have to do that in our previous problems that we worked on Wednesday was because we took the sources out. So we made an assumption that everything was going to decay to zero. So effectively, what we were saying is that all of the energy stored in our energy storage element, be it a capacitor or an inductor, got converted to heat by our resistors. Now we have a condition where there may still be some energy stored in our energy storage elements because there's a forcing function that makes that happen. All right, good questions today. Um, dang it, I did this on the wrong page. So let me hit document append. All right, so our next step um, will be to calculate the time constant tau for our system. Okay. So to be very, very clear about this again, when we calculate the time constant, we are looking for what the time constant is during the transient condition. Okay, because during the either of the steady state conditions, there is no time constant because nothing's changing. So there is no rate of exponential decay to quantify. So for our RC circuit here, tau is REQ multiplied by CEQ. And again, we should see that it's pretty obvious that CEQ is simply 0 0.5 farads because there's literally only one capacitor in the circuit, so it can't be anything else, all right? To determine our time constant, what we're gonna have to do is look at that network from the perspective of the capacitor, meaning we pull the capacitor out and look in through its terminals that's left behind during the transient condition, and we're gonna be looking at a dead network so it's the exact same thing as the Thevenin resistance. So because we're turning off our current source, that's just a big open circuit, right? So we're gonna have, that looks crappy. That certainly does not look like a five. I don't know what's going on with my pen. There we go. So we have that five ohm resistor. We have a five ohm resistor. Because we're looking at it during the transient condition, our 20 ohm resistor is shorted out. Here's our terminals where our capacitor was. So we're looking in through these terminals. So here we have a 10 ohm resistor. 
here we have another 10 ohm resistor. And then finally, we have our other five ohm resistor that was tied to the bottom of the current source. So what is the equivalent resistance that the capacitor sees? It may be helpful to look at our nodes and do a simple resistance calculation, right? So first, um, does this five ohm resistor here do anything? It doesn't contribute because one leg of it isn't actually tied to anything. So it doesn't do anything, nor does this guy right here. So really our nodes of interest are this guy this guy and this guy. So let's call it A, B, and C, okay? So between A and B, I have that five ohm resistor directly. And then going around the other path, I can go from A to C, where I will see the 10 ohm resistor. And then from C to B is the other 10 ohm resistor. So our equivalent resistance is then what? Five in parallel with 20, right? Which is going to be four, I think, if my mental math is right. So 100 over 25, yeah, that's four. From this, our time constant is two seconds. One half times four is two. And obviously then tau to the negative one power is 0 0.5 per second. Uh, so before we move along to putting things into our generic expression, does anybody have any questions or comments about how we calculated the equivalent resistance in this circuit? Why I chose having uh, the 20 ohm resistor here shorted out, why we didn't include either of these 5 ohm resistors, why there's not a current source, anything like that. All of that makes sense. Okay, because this is where I see probably the most errors, especially on your exams and stuff like that, is determining the equivalent resistance. So I want to be very, very explicit about the steps that I'm taking to do it. We're looking at the circuit during the transient condition, and we have to look at a dead network. All right, so our last step then is to put the info into our generic equation. And our generic equation is gonna be slightly different than what we had last time because we have to take into account that things are no longer settling to zero. So our generic equation or our total response is now y at zero minus for t less than zero minus, so that didn't change at all. And we're gonna see a change right here where it's y at zero plus minus y at infinity e to the minus t over tau plus y at infinity for t greater than or equal to zero plus. And the reason that we have to make this change is because this is what's ensuring that our capacitor voltage doesn't change abruptly at between t is equal to zero minus and t is equal to zero plus. Right, so if we didn't put this in, if we just left it as y at zero plus, 
Um, so let's see just real quick what would happen, okay? So we're gonna have VC of T is equal to Y at zero minus, which was negative 20 volts for T less than zero minus. Um, if we just put in Y at zero plus here, that would be negative 20 E to the minus 0 0.5 T plus 12 volts for T greater than or equal to zero plus. Now, I wanna be clear, this is an intentional mistake in it for the, for the second part. If I evaluate this guy at exactly T is equal to zero, what I have is negative 20 plus 12, which is negative eight. And negative eight does not equal negative 20. That's why we have to subtract um, Y at infinity here. So we're gonna instead, we have negative 20 minus 12 is negative 32. So that now when we evaluate this expression at t is equal to zero, we're gonna see negative 20 volts both at t is equal to zero minus and at t is equal to zero plus. So our capacitor voltage is continuous. We are going to apply that change for all of our signals, regardless of whether it's a capacitor voltage or a capacitor current, inductor voltage, inductor current, resistor voltage, resistor current. We're still gonna just use this one generic expression for everything and it works out perfectly. And it's gonna be actually pretty neat on Monday because the lab that we're doing is literally going to prove this. We are going to literally see the exponential response of a, uh, the voltage drop over a capacitor and prove that it follows this mathematical model perfectly. Um, all right, so any questions on this particular problem? Yes. So we're, uh, so you're, you're asking about why I'm adding this guy right here, right? So we know that at infinity, our capacitor voltage should settle to some finite value, right? Well, this exponential function, as time increases, it's just getting smaller and smaller and smaller. So as T approaches infinity, that first term approaches zero. So how is it gonna to settle to the, the value it has at infinity if we don't explicitly add it in and force it to be that way? So for this problem, uh, graphically, let's, let's look at um, what it is. Let's see. So here's T. Here's VC of T. And just for the sake of argument, um, here's minus 20 volts and here's plus 12 volts. So our capacitor voltage is going to be down here and at infinity, let's just say for the sake of argument that infinity is up here. This is what our decay is going to, or this is what our um, voltage is gonna look like. So it's gonna grow like that, yeah. Um, so we see that the exponential portion, it's, so it starts out down here at way at negative 20 and it's getting smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller until it no longer inflates at that point. Um, okay, so I do have a second problem, but I don't think we can finish it in 10 minutes. Um, so what do you guys want to do for the next 10 minutes? Yeah. Uh, so typically speaking, uh, that's a very good question. Um, so let's look at uh, one of the old exams. We'll spend a couple of minutes doing that, if that's okay with you guys. Um, let's see. Let's open 
cold tests and an exam too. Hopefully this is the test. Yeah, okay, this is the test. Right? Um, so this is really the last big topic that we're covering. So it's going to be the last problems. Okay. So let's look at this guy right here. Um, so this is one circuit. Um, it's a simple total response problem. We can tell that it's a total response problem because that four volt source on the left hand side is never getting moved into or out of the circuit. So it's, it, uh, the capacitor voltage is going to settle to some DC value. Um, the first question asks you to evaluate the circuit at T is equal to zero minus and find the value of this voltage. Okay. The second question asks you to evaluate the circuit at T is equal to zero plus and determine the value of the current. So um, you're not asked to find the value of the voltage again because it's not going to change. So, you know, that, that would be boring or whatever. Um, the third question asks you to find what's going on at T is equal to infinity, right? Um, and then the fourth question asks you for the time constant. And the fifth question asks you to put all of that together and evaluate your expression at a particular point in time. So on this particular test, which was a 35 question test, there were five questions on a total response of an RC circuit, and there were five questions on the total response of an RL circuit. So 10 of the 25 circuit analysis questions were based entirely on um, this, this topic of, of first order circuit analysis. I think I'm going to change that slightly on um, the upcoming exam, meaning you probably won't have to work an RL circuit and an RC circuit, it will just be one or the other. Um, because if I'm limited to 20 questions, having literally half the test be two circuits to where if you make a mistake on the very first one, it will cause you to fail the exam, seems like a terrible idea. Um, so I'm gonna try to limit the scope on that and to give a little bit more variety so that if you do make a mistake, it's not going to literally cause you to fail the whole test. So I think that's a pretty reasonable approach. I hope we, hopefully you guys agree. Uh, we'll see, but, uh, but yeah, so it'll likely be five problems based on an RL circuit like this, or RL or RC circuit like we've been analyzing. And then the other 15 problems will be related to, uh, so there'll be some Thevenin and Norton at the beginning because that wasn't, that was, wasn't on the first test, so it should be on this one. Then um, current voltage, power, and energy relationships for capacitors and inductors, and then one RL or one RC circuit that'll have multiple questions asked about it. Does that seem reasonable? So same basic format, but just less questions. So there won't be as much redundancy. So, you know, on this guy, I asked, like I said, an RC question. Then up here, we have an RL question. Um, I like to ask one question like this, uh, which is very similar to uh, homework 12, problem five, where we, it's not a DC circuit, but it's not a transient analysis circuit either. So there's just some exponential uh, excitation and you have to use the uh, current voltage relationships for capacitors and inductors to figure out what's going on. I really like asking exactly one question of this format. Um, so just giving you guys a heads up. Homework 12, problem five, or something very similar to that is going to show up on the test. Um, and then prior to this, you know, this problem right here is a DC circuit with inductors and uh, capacitors. And I'm going to ask you for the energy stored. Um, so instead of asking two questions about it. I might just ask one question or something. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to have space to ask a resistor combination problem or a capacitor combination problem. Um, so uh, I, I don't know for sure, but you know, uh, excuse me, inductors in series, I'd like resistors in series, inductors in parallel, I'd like resistors in parallel, capacitors in series, I'd like resistors in parallel, capacitors in parallel, I'd like resistors in series. This this should be a throwaway problem if it shows up. Um, 
here's something again where I may have to limit the scope of what I do. So I have a graph problem for a capacitor and then I ask three things about that particular graph. And then the previous problem I gave, uh, oh, it's a graph problem about an inductor. And I asked three questions. I thought I, thought I had stopped doing that. Um, so something alternative to that would be, I give you a mathematical function for an inductor and you have to do two things. And then I give you a graph for a capacitor and you have to answer two questions or something like that. And so just, uh, you know, same basic format, just slightly shorter. So I'm not asking you as many questions about the different topics. Um, okay, so four minutes early is good enough for me. Um, so I'll see you guys on Monday for our lab. Yes, sir. Let me find my mask. What's your name? Oh, so, yeah, let me. This is your second time being late in two days. Yeah. First time, bad differential rate. That was no good. No, I'll play the field from left guys at it. It's kind of late right now. I'm going to pump it up. I'll find it. Well, good luck with your vehicle. I finally got fed up with uh, my old car and bought a new one over the summer. Yeah. So, thank you. You too. All righty. It's 1.30, so uh, let's get started with the roll. Okay, making sure I haven't muted myself. Um... There we go. Garrett Anders. Thank you. Brandon Bowman. Here. Joshua Brack. Thomas Casey. Here. Gifford Courtney. Paul DeSolar. William Drake, Mr. Glass is right there, Mr. Kachucky is over there, Mr. Fitzgerald is right there, Christian Gil Bustamante, Michael Abair, Derek is over there. Emma Coach, Riley Martin, Emma Michael, Shahara Perez, right there, Cameron Petri, here, Alec Ledek, Colton Shriver, I see him, um, Wesley Sierra. Here. Adam Swallow. Jillian Spelberg. Here. Jace Warren. Iron Wood. And that's that. All right. Um, so. I want to talk to you guys a little bit before we get started today regarding uh, the upcoming lab assignments. Um, so starting with Mini Lab 5 and going all the way through Mini Lab 8, um, these experiments will require the use of an analog function generator. All right, Joshua, I'll take care of you in just a second. Um, and unfortunately, the ones for this room still have not come in. Um, so we have two options. 
Our first option is we can use the diligent boards that are in that closet, uh, that gray metal cabinet thingy. Uh, they have an integrated uh, oscilloscope and function generator and all that kind of stuff. So we could do the labs entirely on them and that would be okay. It would just require you guys to show up uh, with a laptop, download some software, and then get familiar with using it. Take roughly the whole class period to do the lab, which is going to take a long time to go. Um, the second option, and this is the option that the, uh, the first group of students took, if you guys can, we can do it differently, I don't mind, um, is that I set up the experiment up here and then project the results over Zoom and to all the boards and stuff like that. And so that I will do the experiment and then we will talk about the data collection procedure and what the different things mean. So effectively, we'll do the lab experiment as one big group. Um, so do you guys have any preference for option one or option two? Yeah, uh, that was the, the biggest um, concern about option one in the earlier group was, was technical difficulties faced with getting things downloaded. And if you don't have, so I can say I have no problem running um, the program on any of my Windows computers. I don't own a Mac, but I've seen students that have Macs struggle with it. I've also seen students that have Macs not struggle with it. Um, like I said, it doesn't particularly matter one way or the other to me. Let's see what the chat is saying. Okay. Um, yeah, but, uh, but yeah, so, so far, I think the three of you gentlemen said two and then nobody else said anything else. So also two. All right. So we're going to go with option two then for both uh, the, the earlier section and, um, the, the late, the later section of my circuits, uh, one class. Um, okay. So yeah, I'll have to think a little bit about how I'm going to do it, but I'll have it all figured out before Monday. So Monday's class is going to be pretty much just that lab um, anyway. Uh, because the, like, if you look at the homework assignment for lecture 15 or whatever, homework 15, it's literally just more transient analysis problems. Um, they're not any more difficult than any of the other ones. They're just larger, meaning that you have to do like you're forced to do nodular mesh in order to figure out your initial conditions on your capacitor and stuff like that. No new material whatsoever. So Monday we'll just be going over the lab and kind of reinforcing this stuff. Um, all right. So with that out of the way, yes, sir. Right, so the lecture 14 video is what we're going to talk about, or that material is what we're going to talk about today. Um, it's called the total response of RL and RC circuits, the total response of first order circuits. And so what that means is that if we have an excitation function like this problem right here, okay, the two volts uh, in all of our previous examples that we wrote, our sources were effectively switched out meaning that they had no influence on either the capacitor voltage or the inductor current because they were removed from the circuit. And so we saw then that any energy stored by our capacitor or our inductor was converted to heat by our resistors. And so everything decayed to zero, right? All of our exponential decays decay down to zero. Well, now we're looking at what happens when we switch a source in, okay? Meaning, that we should expect that our uh, voltages and currents should decay to a finite value. Okay, so we're no longer making the assumption that everything's going to decay to zero as time progresses. So graphically, what that really looks like is something like this. Or I'm just going to make an educated guess on how this capacitor current I L of T in this circuit is going to behave. And then we'll go through and probably verify things in a minute. So here's I L of T. And here is T. Okay. So our expectation, and I'm just kind of making things up here, 
is that before t is equal to zero, so all time before that, we are at a DC steady state condition. And then a re at t is equal to zero, our switch changes position. And so we're going to have a transient, okay? And then we should expect at t is equal to infinity, and let me explain uh, what I mean by that. At t is equal to infinity, which is just a long time after the switch change states, we are gonna have another DC steady state condition. So just for the sake of argument here, I'm gonna say that maybe our current settles to a negative value. So this is DC steady state as well. And then in between these two DC steady state conditions, we have our transit. That's really only going to influence the way that we approach these circuits in very small ways. Um, we are going to have to analyze the circuit at t is equal to infinity because we can't assume that everything decays to zero. And we're going to have to adjust our gen uh, generic expression for our voltage and current response in these problems to include the information we gain by analyzing the circuit at t is equal to infinity. That's it. Everything else is the exact same as we did. So let's take a look at this particular problem here. Okay, so our first step is going to be to analyze the circuit at t is equal to zero minus. That's always our first step, okay? So at t is equal to zero minus, our switch is closed at position B. So that two volt source is not yet switched into the circuit. That's going to happen at T is equal to zero plus. Um, because we are at DC steady state, we're gonna have to replace our inductor with what? A short circuit, absolutely right. So at T is equal to zero minus, what our circuit looks like is this. We have a short circuit. A five ohm resistor a short circuit another five ohm resistor a dependent voltage source three i r at zero minus And then here is I R at zero minus and I L at zero minus are two quantities of interest for this particular problem. So, can any of you tell me how we can solve for IR and or IL at T is equal to zero minus based on our schematic representation of our circuit at this time? Um, well, so, I mean, I, I'm not saying we can't use nodal analysis, but if we looked at this real quick, yeah, there, there's really only two nodes and one of them is ground. Um, so let, but, but that, does include uh, some probably good information. And so let me explain what, what I mean by that. So let's say that we chose, let's, let's label this node, okay? That's all one node. And then this is our other node. So let's, for the sake of argument, 
consider that dark green node to be ground. What does that tell us about IR zero minus? So if there's no potential difference over it, right, because it has the same node on both sides, what does that mean about the current? It's zero. Um, how could we use that to determine IL at zero months? Any thoughts? Um, sure, KCL will work. So we have a current of zero amps going in. What is this dependent source going to look like? If IR is zero, zero volts, which is a short circuit or open circuit? It's a short circuit as well. Okay. So we effectively have, and um, I'm just going to scribble this down real quick. We have a five ohm resistor and a five ohm resistor. And we want to know what the current through the short circuit is. My best guess is it's going to be zero because there's nothing exciting anything anywhere. So I'm going to say that IL at zero minus is also zero amps. And we could easily prove that actually just doing Kirchhoff's current law, or really, our, excuse me, Kirchhoff's voltage law, really just doing mesh and then saying, well, if the current around this mesh is zero, then this other current also has to be zero around that. So. All right. So our circuit analysis here, fairly straightforward. We didn't have any dependent or independent sources in to excite anything, so it shouldn't be too much of a revelation that our resistor and inductor currents were zero. Now we're gonna need to analyze the circuit at T is equal to zero plus. So at T is equal to zero plus, Let's look back up here and see what's going on. So at T is equal to zero plus, our switch moves from being closed at position B to being closed at position A, which means we have switched in that two volt source, okay? We are no longer at DC steady state, so we're no longer going to use a short circuit to approximate our inductor. And we'll talk about specifically what we're gonna do here in just a second. Um, but let's draw, so we have our two volt source, five ohm resistor. Our inductor is gonna be down. We'll figure out what we're gonna do with that in a second. All righty, so first things first. Here's IR at zero plus. What are we going to do with our resistor? Or excuse me, our inductor. What do we know about it? Right, the current flowing through the inductor at zero plus is what, Mr. Ekachaku? Zero amps. So, Exactly right. It cannot change instantaneously. So if it was zero amps at T is equal to zero minus, it must continue being zero amps at T is equal to zero plus. That's true only for inductor currents and capacitor voltages. So how do I create a zero amp current source? What is that? Fundamentally, no current can flow through it. An open circuit. So we're going to replace our inductor with an open circuit. And I want to be really, really clear. The reason we're replacing our inductor with an open circuit is because we know that no current flows through it. So this is not a mistake. We're not treating it like a capacitor. For this very specific case where the current flowing through it is zero, we get to say that it's behaving as if it were an open circuit. So obviously then 
I L at zero plus and zero amps, which we already have written down. So how are we going to determine I R at zero plus? Um, I disagree. So the reason why I disagree is because it's a single loop circuit. So, right? We can't use voltage division either because we don't know. So using voltage division would require us to know what this potential is and what this potential is, and then take the difference between them. But the potential on the right hand side is a function of the current that we're trying to find. There's only one mesh. So Kirchhoff's, anytime we have a single loop circuit, Kirchhoff's voltage law is where our mind should immediately go. Okay. So writing a KVL equation, we're going to have negative two volts plus five ohms times I R at zero plus plus another five ohms times I R at zero plus plus three I R at zero plus is equal to zero. So that means two volts is equal to five plus five plus three is 13 I R at zero plus. So I R at zero plus is two over 13. Okay. Just put all out, right? Unless I made a mistake, which if I did, please point it out. Um, yeah, so we had a single loop circuit. So we want to find the current in a single loop circuit. KVL is usually the way to go. And by usually, I mean the only time I wouldn't do it is if there was a current source in there because that would tell me what the current is. Um, all right, so any questions about our analysis at T is equal to zero minus? All righty. So now we need to analyze the circuit at T is equal to infinity. So let's look back at our original circuit and see what this means. So let's start here because this is something that I see students do a lot and I'm very confused by. Our switch moves from position B to position A at T is equal to zero plus, and then it stays there. So I want to be very clear, the switch is not going to swing back the other way unless we're explicitly told it does that. So at T is equal to infinity, the two volt force is switched in, but we're also at DC steady state, which means our inductor looks like a short circuit, okay? So at T is equal to infinity, is a long time after our transient condition has died out. So we are inherently at DC steady state. Level. So our circuit of interest that we're going to be analyzing Is this guy where we are trying to find this current and this current. That does not look like anything. So how can I solve for either of those currents? Anybody care to venture a suggestion? Mesh, okay. Um, sure, let's do mesh. Let's call this guy I1, let's call this guy I2. So, there are no current sources, so we don't have to worry about super meshes or current relationships or anything like that. So around mesh one, we have negative two volts plus five ohms times I1 
is equal to zero. One equation, one unknown. So let's just go ahead and solve that for I1. Anybody? Yeah, two bits. Like 0.4 amps or whatever you want to call it. And we could have observed that anyway. Um, we know that there's a two volt drop over the five ohm resistor because the positive polarity terminal is connected to that leg of the resistor and the negative polarity terminal is connected to that. So we did mesh where Ohm's law would have worked. Uh, for our second mesh, we're gonna have five ohms times I2 plus three times I R at infinity is equal to zero. So let's figure out what's I R at infinity. The two fifths. So five I2 plus six fifths is equal to zero. What's I2? So 5x plus 6 fifths is equal to 0. All right. Yep. All right. And from this, Come on, dummy. There we go. What is I L with my pen to the right? Is I one minus I two? So that would be 10 25ths minus negative 6 25ths is positive 16 over 25. I did my math right. Somebody there. Okay, getting some head shaking. Yes. And just to be clear, R, R at infinity was 2 fifths. Okay. Okay. Um, so we did mesh there, um, but I would argue again that it's entirely unnecessary um, because we could figure out IR using Ohm's law, and then we could have just said that three IR divided by five plus two divided by five is equal to that current as well, just using KCI. But whatever floats your boat. Exactly right. So we couldn't use Ohm's law before because we didn't know what the voltage drop over the resistor was. Now it's explicit, right? Okay, so step four. Is to find the time constant for our circuit. This is an example of an RL circuit. And so tau is defined as the equivalent inductance divided by the equivalent resistance, where our equivalent inductance, LEQ, is going to be what? 50 nanohenry, the only inductor in the circuit, so it can't be anything else. That, that fits pretty easy. All right. Now, we need to figure out REQ, okay? And so we are gonna find REQ during the transient condition from the perspective of the inductor. So that means we take the inductor out and then we look into the dead network and figure out what the equivalent inductance is. So during the transient condition, I have my two volt source, I have my five ohm resistor. Here are the terminals where my inductor was 
and then here. Let's just call them IR. There's IR. I've intentionally made a mistake. Who can tell me what it is? Exactly right. The two volt source needs to be turned off. We have to be looking at a dead network. So all of our independent sources are off. All right. So this is our network. How are we going to determine the equivalent resistance? I don't follow your logic. So there's a dependent source in the circuit, right? That's gonna have some influence on the uh, equivalent resistance. So how do we handle finding equivalent resistance when there's a dependent source? Test source method, all right. So using the test source method, we have the choice of applying either a voltage source or a current source. Which one would you guys care to do? Current source, direction up or down? Down, Already. Okay, and so our goal is then to find this, oh sorry, it should be positive polarity on bottom because the head of the arrow is down here. Our goal is to find this voltage V test um, because we know that V test divided by the test current source of one amp will give us our Thevenin resistance. So what circuit analysis technique do we want to employ to determine V-test? Um, KCL, okay, at which node? All right, so we'll be adding this current and this current and this current. Um, the current directed to the left over the 5 ohm resistor would be the voltage drop over that 5 ohm resistor, which we don't know, divided by 5 ohms, plus our 1 amps down, plus the voltage drop over our 5 ohm resistor to the right, which we don't know, divided by 5 ohms. So KCL, at least a single application of KCL isn't going to get it done. So we could do multiple applications of KCL, meaning nodal analysis, and probably come up with something. Uh, we could do uh, mesh analysis as well and come up with something that would be reasonably easy. Um, and so let me explain, so let me explain my, my argument for saying mesh analysis would be pretty reasonably easy here. I can move that five ohm resistor from there to here changes nothing, right? I just slid it around this thing. Obviously, the voltage drop over the 5 ohm resistor, positive polarity on bottom is the exact same thing as V-test because that 5 ohm resistor is in parallel with that current source. So we could use a mesh, find that mesh current I1, multiply it by 5, and we have our answer. Or we could do nodal analysis and find it directly. Which way do you guys want? The leftmost 5 ohm resistor is in parallel with the 1 amp source, yes. Because when that voltage source is short circuited, that short circuit is in series. And so that effectively connects. Um, so when we had that resistor up here, the right leg was connected to this node and the left leg was connected to that node, meaning they're in parallel. 
So what mesh or nodal pick one? Mesh. Okay. So let's do mesh. Here's my current I1. Here's my current I2. So we have an interior current source. So we're going to start with a current relationship. What's that going to be? One amp is equal to I1 minus I2. Absolutely correct. Now we're going to have to write a super mesh KVL equation around the out hands, uh, around the outside loop, right? So somebody start me off there. Where are you starting from? Up here? Okay. What's IR in terms of our mesh currents? So let's I1. Okay, so 3I1. Next. 5I1. Next. 5I2. All right. So let's solve those guys. And we'll have I1 is equal to IR is equal to something. And then I2 is equal to something. All right, so I have one, negative one, positive one, three plus five is eight, five, zero. So I got I1 is equal to five thirteenths of an amp. And I2 is equal to negative 8 thirteenths of an amp. So from this, REQ is equal to, oh, well, no, we're not quite ready yet, actually. V test is going to be 5 ohms times I1. So that's 25 thirteenths of a volt. Right? Okay. And so from that, REQ, which is V test over I test, 25 thirteenths of an ohm. Because our test current was one. So when we choose one amp, that makes it really easy. Whatever we get for our test voltage divided by one gives us our resistance. So from this, our time constant is 50 times 10 to the minus nine Henry's divided by 25 thirteenths of an ohm. Two point six times ten to the minus eight seconds. And the inverse of tau is I'm not going to look very good. Three eight. Why is my pen writing so terrible? Three eight four six one five three eight point four six etc. Um, so 
So 38,461,538.46. All right, so our last step is to put our collected information into our generic equation. And our generic equation is going to look slightly different than it did previously because we now have information that our current isn't going to settle to a value of zero at t is equal to infinity. So our generic equation, y of t, will now look like this. It's going to be y at zero minus for t less than zero minus, and it'll be y at zero plus minus y of infinity e to the minus t over tau plus y at infinity for t greater than or equal to zero plus. And I'm going to explain why we have to make that change to our generic equation by intentionally making a mistake in just a second. Okay. So let's look at our inductor current, I L as a function of time. What was the value of the inductor current at t is equal to zero, minus zero, right? So we just had zero amps. So, uh, and this is gonna be glaring actually. If I don't include subtracting my y at infinity, then this would look like zero e to the minus, I'm just gonna call it uh, t over tau for right now because that number is really large. Um, plus sixteen twenty fifths of an amp. So recall that the current flowing through a capacitor cannot change a bump, meaning that if we evaluate this function at t is equal to zero minus and t is equal to zero plus, we should get the exact same answer, right? So at t is equal to zero minus, obviously we get zero amps. At t is equal to zero plus, with this expression, we get 16 over 25. And zero and 16 over 25 are not the same thing. So there's an issue. That's why we have to do zero plus minus what's going on at infinity. So the correct expression should be minus 16 25ths here, like so. And that correction is applicable to all of our quantities, not just the current through an inductor. Um, so if we wanted to find, so uh, actually, let, let's do just that. We have the information for IR of T collected as well, right? So what was IR at zero minus? Zero as well. What was IR at zero plus? Two fifths, right? Okay, no, zero, two thirteenths. That's right, that's what I couldn't hear you, I'm sorry. Uh, so it was two thirteenths. minus the two fifths that we saw at t is equal to infinity, e to the minus t over tau, where again, I'm just not writing out that big long ugly number, plus two fifths of an amp for t greater than or equal to zero plus. And so now we can simplify two thirteenths minus two fifths, negative 16 over 65 e to the minus t over tau plus two fifths of an amp for t greater than or equal to zero plus. Now, if we analyze this at t is equal to zero plus, we would find that, um, 
we were going to have 16 60 fifths, which would be negative 16 over 65 plus 2 fifths, which is 2 thirteenths. Yeah, I should have known that already. All right. Does it matter that at t is equal to 0 plus, our resistor current does not equal to what it was at t is equal to 0 minus? Is it okay that our resistor currents are discontinuous? Absolutely. Doesn't matter at all. The only two quantities that re are required to be continuous functions are the capacitor voltage and the inductor current. Everything else can change as much as it needs to in a, an instant in time. Okay. Why, why can't the capacitor voltage change or why can, let's say, the capacitor current? Okay, so we have um, our fundamental relationship. So let's, let's just talk about an inductor explicitly here, okay? So in an inductor, we have our voltage is equal to L di by dt, right? That's our fundamental relationship for the capacitor uh, current voltage relationship for an inductor. All right, so let's say that we have a waveform. It's really bothering me that my pen is not writing where I want it to, but I'll figure that out. Here's t. Here's I L of t. And let's say, just for the sake of argument, that our current is constant. What does that mean about our voltage? It has to be equal to zero, right? If the current doesn't change, then the derivative of the current is zero and L times that derivative is then zero. Now let's say that we have the following current waveform. Starts off at zero, instantaneously jumps up some value. And then it's constant again. What's going to happen to our voltage? So I would argue, let's call this time right here T naught. Okay. So I would argue that over the time interval from zero to T naught, we're gonna have zero volts because the current's constant. And over the time interval from T naught plus to infinity, it's also gonna be constant zero because our current is constant. But at that one particular instant in time, we are gonna have an impulse function to where our voltage approaches infinity for a split second. What does it mean for a voltage to approach infinity? What is voltage? Fundamentally, it is the amount of energy required to move charge between two points in a circle. So if the voltage is infinite, that means that we have created an infinite amount of energy in an infinitesimal amount of time if we allow the current through an inductor to change a bubble. Right? So that's why that can't happen. It's the exact same relationship for the capacitor, uh, the voltage drop over a capacitor. We'll see the exact same thing. It will create an infinite current, which means we've created an infinite amount of charge out of nowhere for that instant of time. Right. All the other quantities don't have that fundamental limitation because there's no derivative based relationship. Okay. So that's where it's coming from mathematically. Um, what we're going to do in the lab on Monday 
is we're going to, and I say we, I'm going to, and then you guys are going to see it, um, explore the current voltage relationship for a practical uh, capacitor and see that actually all of these things that we have mathematically derived exactly model how these things behave in the real life. Okay. Um, so hopefully that'll solidify things and maybe alleviate a couple of questions too. Um, all right, so it's two minutes until the end of the class, which means it's the end of the class. Um, so um, I'll see you guys on Monday for the lab. Uh, this weekend, I'm gonna work on putting up some more practice problems and all that kind of stuff for you guys. Um, and uh, one thing that a couple of students have been, I guess, confused about, um, I record all these Zoom lectures, but maybe it was difficult to find them because they're just on my YouTube channel. So I'm gonna have all of them uploaded to our classes Moodle page as well so that you can find everything a little bit easier um, because I have all of my classes stuff on my YouTube page. So it's circuits one interspersed with an integrated circuit design class interspersed with FYE. It's a hot mess of stuff. So I'll try to make it a little bit easier for you guys to find things. Yes, so all of the, uh, I think I have. Okay, so then yes, I will, I will get all the ones that aren't currently on there. Um, up. Um, I'll have to, I, I think I should have access to, if Davis used my Zoom link, I should have access to that one where he had to sub for me on Monday. But yes, I, I'm gonna, my intention for this weekend is to get all of those lecture, uh, the Zoom lecture videos up on YouTube and then also put links to all of the YouTube on our course page so that it's a little easier to find them instead of having to go through all that stuff. So that you can find everything that you need just by using our course's Moodle page. Uh, no, I'm gonna work on that this weekend too. Davis has my solutions and I'm lazy and I didn't want to have to remake it. You too, see you guys later.